Okay, finally today, I want to briefly talk about a key feature of supersonic flows, which is shock waves. Now, there's not going to be a detailed discussion of supersonic flow in this course. Uh, the gas dynamics course essentially covers supersonic flows. But here we're briefly going to discuss shock waves as a necessity for considering, considering compressible flow over airfoils. So let's say we have an airfoil with some subsonic flow coming at it, but that's a high subsonic Mach number. When you get a region on the suction surface of the airfoil where the flow is accelerated such that the Mach number becomes supersonic locally, then it's possible that shocks will occur. And basically, this is a thin region, which is what I've shown here, in which the flow properties suddenly change dramatically. And the shock might be on the order of something like 10 to the minus 7 meters thick. This can be normal to the flow, or more commonly at some angle, what we call an oblique shock. So here's the key differences between the two. For a normal shock, the upstream Mach number is supersonic. There's some pressure and some entropy. And afterwards, there's a subsonic Mach number. The pressure goes up and the entropy goes up. For an oblique shock, things look similar on the upstream side. But downstream, the flow has turned. The Mach number is less than the up incoming Mach number, but may still be supersonic. The pressure still rises, as does the entropy. Note in both cases, a, sh a, shock, a shock is a sudden compression. P2 is always greater than P1 across a shock. Now the flow across the shock is adiabatic, but as I've shown here, it's not isentropic. The entropy increases. So the total enthalpy, that, therefore, is constant across the shock. HT1 equals HT2. Since it's not isentropic, and S2 is greater than S1, then that tells us that PT2 is less than PT1. So the stagnation pressure decreases across the shock. Again, the key difference between normal and oblique shocks is that the normal shock always has a subsonic Mach number after the shock, whereas an oblique just has a decrease in Mach number, which may still be supersonic. We'll keep these points in mind in the following lectures. Before I finish today, I want to show a brief video that I happened to capture on a flight that I took in about the middle of 2013. And what you're going to see is uh, me filming out the window of... Uh, I believe a Boeing 767 um, that was crossing the Atlantic where the lighting conditions were such that the shock on the wing of this aircraft was clearly visible and as the aircraft maneuvered slightly during the period of this video that's about 10 seconds long you can see the shock moving around because of the change in speed. So you can see the shock here on the wing, and you can see that the plane's accelerating a little bit, so the shock's pushed back. Play it one more time. So the shock's moving forward and backwards as the airspeed changes slightly. And it's more difficult to see, but the shock actually curves out here onto the wing as well. So that's just a quick video of a shockwave in action, um, which helps illustrate exactly what it is that I'm talking about when I draw this picture here. So that's the end of our discussion on supersonic flows, and next time we'll start talking about compressible subsonic flows and how to adapt our previous uh, analytical theory for predicting flow over airfoils and wings to the compressible situation.